My name is Olivia. <laughs> Hello. <How laughs> Welcome to the team program. I'm fine. Thank I'm you. Fine. That's just cool. um, each of us have questions to ask you in about your life and your career and uh, how the stuff that you associate with, like arts and government, especially in our community. So um, the first question that I have for you is, in regards to your life, what was your childhood like and how did it make you into the person you are today? You know, interesting. Um, I grew up in, a, I'm from Argentina, Buenos Aires. I grew up in a neighborhood that um, it's very similar to, um, you know, the neighborhoods in the Bronx, you know, sort of it's not um, the suburbs in which you just live alone in one block, but it's also not as dense as Manhattan, right? Sort of low houses and stuff like that. And what's interesting is I grew up um, my the first ten years of my life. My country was under a military dictatorship. You know what that is? Is yeah. when you know you don't have a democratic president. You know, and the military the military um, takes over the government, and there's no democracy. And then when I turned nine ten years old the country went back to democracy and there was sort of a, an explosion of you know freedom and you could see a lot of um, artists taking advantage you know like that they were not censored anymore and that they could express themselves so i i believe that growing up in that moment of the country in which people felt free to express themselves which a lot of them were doing it through arts and culture has informed a lot you know who i am as a person Right, I'm sort of um, my interests are not only arts and culture, but also the idea of, of civic participation. How, as an individual, you take leadership in um, helping shape, you know, your neighborhood, your community, your city, you name it. There's a project by uh, Marta Minujín, who's an Argentinian artist, who, um, right after the um, military government left, she created. Um, you all seen images of the Parthenon in Greece, right? The um, Greek temple. So usually the Parthenon is used as a symbol for democracy because, you know, the Greeks um, invented, you know, democracy or a version of it. So what she decided to do is create a structure in which a lot of the books that had been censored and banned by the military government were going to be affixed to this um, um, copy replica of the uh, Parthenon, the structure that was on view for like two weeks. And then after that, people could come in, enter that structure and pull, you know, the books were like in plastic bags and just pull the books and take them home. And there was a little bit of, you know, signaling, you know, the that there was a moment of participation in arts and culture that these books were not um, banned anymore and that, um, you know, people could have access to them. And I always remember, my, I was nine, 10 years old when my parents took me to see that and I always remember that as the first experience I had, you know, in sort of participatory arts and culture. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to ask about um, if you did have any struggles, what type of struggles did you face growing up as identifying as queer and being part of the Latinx community? So, you know, growing up in Argentina, we are all Latinx, so, you know, it didn't felt, you know, that I was part of a minority, but uh, one of the biggest challenges is even though I didn't know explicitly growing up that I was queer, I knew there was something different about me. And I grew up, you know, pretty much like most of us Latinx, I grew up in a Catholic family and in which, you know, um, being queer wasn't okay. So, um, and so there was a lot of guilt, you know, like I started, you know, developing feelings, you know, for, you know, um, male friends. And I felt really guilty about that. And it felt really, I felt really bad about it. And I felt I couldn't, um, I couldn't share that with anyone. And I couldn't, you know, figure out, you know, what to do with that. And part of that has to do with um, the idea that I couldn't see um, in my life other fellow queer people, right? Other adults that were queer and they could show me, you know, a model of, you know, that being queer was okay and that you can have, you know, a normal, comfortable life. 
But at the same time, as I was looking at the movies, as I was reading books, as I was going to museums, you know, all the cultural production of you know, society in Argentina did not, you did not see representations of uh, queer people. And if you see where, you know, sort of um, stereotypes that didn't have, you know, a, it, it wasn't a positive representation of, you know, queerness. So that didn't help. And so a lot of my work, not only now as a commissioner of cultural affairs, but, you know, having worked at El Museo del Barrio, at the Sloma Museum, is about, you know, how do we make sure that we put out there in society um, these uh, mirrors so the different people with different backgrounds and different experiences can see themselves reflected in society and the empowerment that comes and seeing, you know, this is what's happening to me now. It's not happening only to me, it's happening to a lot of people and it's okay and I can connect with them and, and together we can feel, you know, a sense of belonging to society. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got you. Thank you so much. No problem. What made you want to study design and architecture at the Universidad del Bergarona? Um, I, I see that you did research. When I was growing up in Argentina, I knew I wanted to do something in the arts and culture. Um, there wasn't a lot of options in, in school, universities and colleges to do the work that I wanted to do. There also wasn't a lot of models, right? You know, like, um, I didn't know any museum directors, I didn't know any museum educators, I didn't know any commissioners of culture, right? So I knew that I liked to work on that, but I, there was no profession, like you can say, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever, at that moment. And part of that is because there didn't want some programs in universities that would teach, you know, the work. And, you know, like nobody wakes up, grows up saying, I want to work in a museum, right? You know, because you're not exposed to those uh, careers. At the same time, you know, typical Latinx family, my parents wanted me to go to school and get a diploma. I'm sure, you know, you hear that all the time. Your parents saying you're gonna go to college and you're gonna get a diploma. Um, so we sort of, I sort of negotiated with my parents that, you know, if I was going to do that, I was going to do something that was somehow created. So I decided to go to architecture school. And as I was um, choosing, you know, the elective um, courses in the career, I was just taking it more into the direction of art history, um, architectural history, and, and less about, you know, construction, you know, um, engineering and systems, and, and just sort of like trying to get as close as it could to um, arts and culture. And it was interesting because of my diploma as an architect, I got to work in a couple of places, in a couple of them, um, museums doing exhibition design. And that was my entry point to museums, right? Even though I wasn't interested in doing exhibition design by doing that, then I start seeing, you know, oh, there's something called a curator. Oh, there's something called a museum educator. And it starts understanding what are the options, career options that you could have working in arts and culture. Thank you for that. Um, I have another question. When yeah. You think home, do you think of Buenos Aires or New York? You know, it's gonna be almost 20 years that I am lived in New York. It's almost all my adult life. As much as I consider myself, identify myself as Argentinian and that's never gonna change. And most of my family is there. I very much consider myself a New Yorker and my, my home is in New York. How did New York's culture and all of uh, everything that happened in New York um, growing up, how did all of that impact your career choice? Uh, again, I believe I, I was always interested in, in arts and culture because I was always interested in constant, be constantly learning. And I'm always fascinated by, um, um, maybe Edwin shouldn't listen to this, but I always say that, you know, the best part of my job and the worst part of my job, do you know what's that? It's working with artists and working with artists. <laughs> um, I really like to work with artists because they're extremely creative. They come up with solutions to, you know, some of the issues. Jada, you were talking about issues in schools. You know, Hugo, you were talking about issues about, you know, the aesthetics of uh, what, what, what seems to be normal and, you know, the obsession with aesthetics, you mm -hmm. know, and as you continue to engage with artists, you see how artists are looking at those issues in our society 
and through their work, they're either making commentary on that, right? Seeing how good or bad those ideas are. They're helping us that look at things in a different way. And sometimes they're holding us accountable, right? You know, like when we say something and then we act differently, the artists through the work, they're showing us that. So I always knew that I wanted to be around artists and about creative people. But then, you know, as I was, you know, exploring different opportunities and work, sort of the world started opening up, right? Like I said, I started doing exhibition design because that's what I knew as an architect that I could do. But then I entered a museum and I see there was a whole world of opportunities and I started exploring those. Um, and then, you know, once I explored almost every opportunity that was in a museum, I started understanding that museums were working in the context of uh, neighborhoods like the Bronx Museum and communities. And, and those were affected by the decisions that the city was making. And they started being interested in, you know, in that. So that's how sort of my career was a result of exploration and willingness to learn and being challenged, you know, in different roles. What is a commissioner cultural affairs job description? So what is it about? It's funny because um, the, um, the former commissioner left around December last year. And when the city was looking for who was going to be the next commissioner, like you do in any job, right? You know, they start interviewing people. And a friend of mine, um, you know, the, the city reached out to me and reached out to a very good friend of mine who actually was the former director of the Bronx Museum. And, you know, it's interesting how we all react differently. I said, you know, they, they, they called me and said, are you interested in this job? You want to talk about it? I said, yes. And I show up to a meeting. And when they ask her, she says, you know, do you have a job description, right? She's very strategic. And there's no job description. The city didn't have a job description for this. And I still don't have a job description, but I can tell you a little bit, you know, what I do. Um, <clears throat> there are different areas of the work. But um, as you mentioned that, you know, you're interested in these issues and around education and schools. Um, when, when the city looks at those issues that makes decisions, you know, how they're gonna solve those issues or how they're gonna deal with those issues. That's what you would call um, public policy and specifically educational policy, right? So policy are the, way, the decisions that, you know, you make in order to um, solve a, a problem. And when those are made by um, government, being you know, municipal government like, the, government like the city or the state or the federal government, that, that's called policy or public policy. So a lot of my work is to help define public policy, right? And very much that is a lot of people confuse and ties that exclusively with funding. You know what funding is? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the decision of, you know, the city of New York gives, you know, around $200 million a year um, in grants to cultural organizations. So a lot of the decision of um, funding is, um, or the policies around public, um, cultural public policy is, you know, who gets that money, right? So we give that money to the Bronx Museum because they do amazing work with teens in the neighborhood, or should we do it to the Met Museum because they um, um, open the doors to a lot of theories um, in the city. So that's a little part of my job. But also in a moment like this, in which, you know, like I wish we could all be sitting at the, in the galleries of the Bronx Museum and having this conversation face to face, we cannot do it, why? Because um, cultural organizations have to close their buildings, right? So a lot of my work these days is to figure out how we can get help cultural organizations to reopen. Um, last week, we were able to convince the mayor that it was safe to reopen museums. And now the mayor that say, yes, you know, we're going to the governor and we're working for the governor at the state to say, yes, it's okay, it's safe to open museums. And there's a lot of work that goes to that, deciding, you know, where are the safety policies, if you will, that, you know, we need to have in order for the staff of the museum and also the visitor to feel safe and welcome. How did you become a, a cultural commissioner? It's a combination of things. And, you know, like speaking from the perspective of career, um, if you, you all have done some research, you can see that most of my work was like I said, at the intersection of arts, culture, and communities and civic participation. 
and there are very strong values that come from the work that I was doing about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we have a mayor who ran on a platform saying that, you know, if, if, we, if he got elected, he was going to put a lot of emphasis on making our city a lot more equitable. So you already have, you know, a mayor who's my boss and who's the one that hired me and myself having, you know, an overlap on what our values, right? What do we believe in? Um, mm -hmm. So that helped. What also helped is that the former commissioner, Tom Tinkerpo, um, not only was a friend and a colleague, but he, uh, I had worked with him uh, many times. I had volunteered while he was a commissioner. He asked a few of us to do some volunteer work to help him make decisions on some policy issues. So he had, it's almost like, I, I almost did like an internship with him, if you will, by volunteering and showed him you know, my capacity. So when he left and the city, the mayor asked him, you know, who do you think should be the next commissioner? You know, in addition to a few other names, he said, you know, you should talk to Gonzalo. You know, he did, you know, all these projects for us. And he was pretty good at that, right? So he took the opportunity to volunteer and do some work. So somebody that was in a position of power and that could affect my career could see, you know, what I had to offer. Yeah. And then I had to go through a round of interviews, like all of us have to do when we um, when we apply for a job, and really um, try to make sure they understood what I had to offer, what was the experience I had, and you know what I was hoping to do um, with the agency. So there was a lot of uh, research that I had to do in advance to understand, you know, what the agency um, was doing, what was the capacity understand what the city wanted to do and make sure that we were in agreement of what that would look like. How was the translation from the director to commissioner been? So how was that for you? You know, <laughs> that's been interesting, right? Um, I don't know if this came up in your research, but um, my position as commissioner was announced on um, the second week of March, on a Wednesday, that Friday is the Friday that um, it was Friday 13. It was the Friday that a lot of cultural organizations decided that we needed to close our doors because um, we didn't think we can um, keep the, you know, our visitors and our staff safe. And we were closed. And um, Edwin used to work with me at the museum at Les Lomond. We closed the doors. And for like a couple of weeks, I was working from home with my staff, I was going to stay a little longer at the museum just to make sure the museum was okay before taking this new job. Um, I got sick with COVID. So I was sick for like a month and a half. Uh, and then I just started my new job. And unfortunately, very much like um, with you, I didn't get to meet my staff face to face. So, um, you know, while this is very helpful, you know, like sometimes, you know, there are moments that you wish you could see your staff face to face and be in the same room. Um, so the transition, I'm saying all this to say that the transition was unlike any other transition that I had in my life and probably anybody else, you know, just sort of leaving a job in a moment that, you know, there was so much change at the museum. I wish I could have stayed a little longer to help the staff transition into this new type of work. Um, getting sick, and having to be in the hospital. And then um, in all of a sudden, um, be at the helm of a group of people that I haven't gotten to uh, meet face to face, which is really hard. And I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean by that. The uh, Monday after the um, um, George Floyd was killed by the police, um, a lot of um, my staffers were you know, very, um, very angry, very anxious, very sad. And while we were able to just all get together, it's like 60 of us, we were able to all get together and have conversations about that on Zoom. That was one of the moments I wish we were all in one room together and just, you know, have a different kind of presence and support to each other. And then specifically about the logistics of the job. Um, I think, you know, they're very similar in some ways and very different in others. You know, running a museum, the main difference is the component in which as a museum director, you have to be constantly raising money so you can support, you know, the programs of the museum. And now as a commissioner, I don't have to raise money, but I'm on the other side. I'm, you know, deciding, you know, which um, organizations get money. So 
that takes a lot of um, sort of stress out of my back. But there's also, you know, I, I would um, say that, you know, the balance of that stress is that, you know, I used to be worried about one cult organization. Now I'm worried about a thousand cult organizations that are in our portfolio. And in a moment like this, really trying to figure out, you know, what's on my power to help them reopen and, and survive this crisis. So I know there has been a lot of hardship. I know that, you know, there has been a lot of negative impact in our communities with this um, um, pandemic and the economic crisis that, you know, um, it, it was created by the pandemic. But at the same time, I'm excited that I'm in a position like this, in a moment like this, because it makes me feel that I'm being useful and, and I could have a leadership and power in order to, you know, help those organizations that I think they need it the most. I guess like my next question, since you kind of talked about it, would be just like, what would you, like what, would, what did you think was like your job when you first, like if COVID didn't happen, what would you think you would be doing right now? So I, just to remind you, when I took the job, um, COVID, you know, was just, we were talking about it, right? You know, so, and also to give you an idea, I started interviewing with the city on December 6th, early December last year, and until mid-March, you know, the job was not announced and I wasn't offered the job. So it was a long process. And although we knew that COVID was a reality, um, you know, and we knew it was going to come to us, even that Friday when we decided to close the museum, um, and I always say this, you know, just to exemplify how little did we know that the impact of the, um, of the pandemic was going to have in our lives, right? We decided that we were going to close the museum for a week, and then every Wednesday, we would just get together and decide if we were going to reopen the week after, right? We thought that this was going to be just a matter of a couple of weeks, and then we're gonna go back to life as, as it is. And here we are, right? You know, our life changed completely in so many ways. But um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I was considering as I was considering this job was that my predecessor had done a lot of work, has created a lot of um, um, initiatives that were about equity and inclusion in, the, in culture organizations. He had managed to get record funding for culture organizations, right? The last two years, the amount of money that the city was distributing in, in, in culture organizations was the highest in the history of the, of the city. And, and I was like, Am I, do, I, do I wanna have this job? You know, I'm gonna be sort of a lame commissioner. You know what a lame duck is? You know, when you have a president that doesn't have any power because the Congress is, you know, um, if you have, let's say, let's say that you have a president, you know, that is from a party and the Congress is complete, Congress is both Senate and, and, and the House of Representatives are both, you know, the other party. There's only so much the president can do, right? And my case was you not know, like, what am I going to do? Everything has been done. Um, little that I know that, you know, the minute after I take this job, that the biggest crisis, the economic crisis and public health crisis, you know, in the city and in the country was going to unfold. So, um, and I'm saying this because if you look at all the jobs that I took in my life, there's always, I always took jobs that they demanded, you know, they had a challenge, right? There was something to fix, that it needed change, and I think those are the best jobs that you can take because it helps you to prove your skills and it helps you to prove who you are. And then when you're about to look for the, the job after that one, you can always say, well, when I came in, you know, the Bronx Museum has this issue. This is how I solved it. This, are, you know, this is how the museum is now much better museum. And, you know, and this is how I would like to solve the problem that you are um, posing by giving me this job. If anything, my agency was willing to focus on distributing funds, and in a year that the city doesn't have a lot of money, and you know there's only so much money that we can give, I just want to make sure that also people see our agency not only as a funder, but as an advocate for arts and culture in general. And also just to think, you know, that there's so many other resources we can give, right? We cannot give you money, but we can connect you with somebody else in the city that can help you figure out, you know, 
health policies you know, on your museum and so on and so on. Sometimes people think that money can solve all our problems and sometimes problems can be solved by being smart. Hola, buenas tardes. My name is Alvar and my question for you is um, with this new position, uh, what are your hopes and expectations for the future while being the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs since you just got this position in March? So um, my question is just like, what are, what are your plans for the future? Alvar, you spoke in Spanish with a specific accent. Can I may ask you where you're from? I'm from Argentina. Of course! <laughs> Only with two words I could tell that. Could you tell that, Edwin? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> where in Argentina? Um, my mom, she was born in Corrientes, but um, we, they all live in, um, the rest of my family lives in, uh, in Entre Rios in front of Uruguay. Ah, mm -hmm. Nice. nice. Um, I completely forgot your question. Can you ask the question again? <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, my question is, with this new position, what are your hopes and expectations for the future while being the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs in New York City? You know, um, there are a couple of, um, there are like three things that I'm high level that I've been saying that I want to accomplish or at least get them, you know, just parentheses. Um, commissioners work for the mayor. Um, when the mayor leaves and a new mayor comes in, all the commissioners need to um, resign to their jobs and it's up to the new mayor to decide if you get to stay or not, right? So my job, because um, de Blasio is leaving at the end of next year, I only have um, 18 months of this job. And then I have to uh, cross my fingers and hope that the next um, mayor would want to keep me. You never know. So, but so far I'm only looking at um, the next 18 months. So a lot of the ideas and the goals that I have are, are probably are gonna take a little longer than those 18 months. So it's either get the stuff done or get things in, in place. So regardless of who, who comes after me, that job continues to happen. And one is to um, reopen and recovery our culture organizations, help them do, the, the, do that. But as they do that, not going back to the, new, to the normal, right? Just how we can, now that we have the chance to rethink everything that we do, how we do it, we do it with a lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think there's two good things that happened with the um, pandemic. One is um, that it, it sort of forced all of us to slow down, right, and to think. And two, um, while you know the inequities that are happening in our city, in our society, are not new, the um, pandemic put a magnifying lens on those, right? Um, at the beginning, everybody was saying, you know, the virus does not discriminate. But it was very clear that depending on the neighborhoods that you live, depending on the jobs that you have, depending on you know like your your class, your race, your ethnicity, you would be affected in different ways, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, how do we make sure that um, as museums reopen and cultural organizations reopen, um, we make sure that they're inclusive and equitable and diverse? Right. Two yeah. is. Um, the idea of um, how do we make the agency better? Um, the way that the agency has been a structure has not changed in the last 25 years, right? So it's a structure that is older, much older than many of you, including Edwin. Um, the, uh, so just think you know, how much has changed in our lives in the last 25 years. And, I feel like, you know, by the structure not changing, the agency cannot be reactive to the needs of the culture organizations and the needs of also um, New Yorkers. So a lot of the work that I want to do is how do we change the structure? How do we, what are the departments that we need? What are the skills that we need? Um, and how do we make, change, make those changes to better serve our community? And an example of that is, um, there has been a lot of attention lately to uh, monuments and public art and how those represent the values that we have as a society, right? By some monuments coming down and just by some public art going up, right? I'm sure you saw a lot of the Black Lives Matter murals that were painting across the city. Mm -hmm. Our agency has a really tiny little team of people working on public art 
and they cannot keep up with all the demands to take down monuments and put new monuments that represent, you know, communities of color, you know, different stories. So part of my work is to, to how do we, with the little resources we have, how we make sure that, you know, um, the um, public art unit is equipped to the demands of, you know, society these days. Hello, um, my name is Orion, and I would just like to go on record and ask, what is it like working with programs such as Register to Vote and Percent for Art? We, I, you know, Percent for Art is the, um, the public art unit that I was talking about. Um, and it's one of my favorite parts of the agency because um, it's very smart the way it works, right? Um, usually when you look at the whole city, right? And you have to worry about education, you have to worry about health, you have to worry about public safety, you have to worry about um, transportation as a mayor. Usually arts and culture is not at the top of your priorities, right? You know, sometimes people think, you know, um, it's not as important because they see it as entertainment, right? They don't understand that arts and culture has, you know, a direct impact on the quality of life of all um, New Yorkers. So what well, was it smart? So, you know, you always depend on, you know, when the budget, every year the city puts a budget together and decides, you know, how much money they put on different areas. You always have to be fighting to get a little more money for arts and culture, right? And make a case in like year like this, you know, as a mayor, do I put money in hospitals in the middle of a public health crisis? Or do I put it in, in museums, right? You know, what's more important? So the percent for art is a really smart uh, way of making sure that as the city spends money, some of that money goes to arts and culture. And how it works is for every public building that gets built, schools, you know, courthouses, jails, you name it, right? Um, a percentage of the money that is spent on that project has to go to um, commission a piece of public art that is going to be in the building, attached to the building, or somewhere, you know, within the, um, the, the building. You know, they come to the agency and they come to our public art unit and they say, you know, we have this building and what we do is then we, we look for, we do a call for artists to propose ideas of what they would like to do in this building. And then we help them work with the, you know, the city agency that's building, you know, these new, um, making these new constructions happen, making sure that they help the artists and build the, art, the public art. Hi. Um, so my question is a little bit long. It's a two for one special. So here it is. There are, so we did a little bit of research on you and what you do. And we know that there are a lot of different subsections of art and lifestyle that fall under the umbrella of cultural affairs. So I really want to know how, what goes into determining which parts of those subsections uphold culture in New York City, and how do you go about acting on this on the government level? I'm gonna answer that question twofold. One is um, if I were to ask each of you to go around the room or just around the screen, um, to give me, to, to answer the question, what culture means to you, we're going to have a different answer for each person that answers that, right? Uh, you know, culture is very encompassing, inclusive. It could be very encompassing, very inclusive definition, or it could be very narrow. For many, 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 many centuries, if you will, culture was very narrow, was very specific to certain disciplines, was very specific to certain um, um, countries and sort of um, um, cultures, if you will, and was very, was very um, elitist, right? And part of the, uh, what we're seeing happen in our country when we talk about racial justice, is not only about the lives, you know, to me, it's not only about the lives, of course, it's about the lives of the um, black and brown people um, and the rights and, you know, the, the, their freedom, if you will, so many ways, but it's also, you know, how do we start upholding their culture and how do we start um, sort of uh, removing the hierarchies, you know, that exist in culture, right? Um, when you go to, how many of you have been to the Met Museum? I have. So when you enter the Met Museum, um, 
you have on one side, you have um, Greek and Rome. On the other side, you have Egypt. And then when you go up the stairs, you have the arts and culture of um, European countries, right? If you wanna find the arts and culture of the rest of uh, Latin America, that is not the US, if you wanna uh, find the arts and culture of Africa, if you wanna add the arts and culture of you know, Oceania, they're like lost in one corner, very badly lit, you know, it's mostly, you know, anthropological objects. Um, and that tells you, you know, a decision of, you know, a group of people that they decided that there's culture that is better than others, right? So a lot of my work is just to make sure that when we talk about culture, we're extremely inclusive and we remove the hierarchies of that. I don't think one culture is better than the other one. They're just different. And then in terms of disciplines, you know, visual art, performing arts, you know, theater, film, um, sculpture, music, you name it. Um, there are two things happening. Artists are bringing down the barriers between those disciplines and they're working across disciplines. Sometimes you're gonna see them writing a book and sometimes you're gonna see them making a video and sometimes you're gonna painting something, right? Um, so I'm trying to also remove those barriers, but at the same time, I want to be very conscious that, you know, most of my background has been in the visual arts and I don't have a lot of experience in performing arts. So I'm constantly checking myself to make sure that, you know, unconsciously I'm not giving preference to the organizations that feel most fa familiar to me, right? Because I'm, I'm part of government now and we should be treating all organizations um, equally. Uh, my name is Jacob, and I just wanted to ask, um, how do you determine how much funding to allocate where? Because, you know, because, um, so where does the money that the city has come from? Anybody? The people, right? From tax the taxes, right? You know, we all pay taxes when we buy things, when we work, when we um, own a house, we all pay taxes for that. And that money goes into the city and then the city pays for services, right? That they're providing. So because it's the money of the people, um, it would be completely wrong that uh, I would sit in my desk here and decide who gets what, right? That, that wouldn't be democratic and that wouldn't be, um, there would be a lot of conflicts, right? So there's a system that we um, created years ago um, that is called the peer, proce peer panel process in which every year organizations write grants and they said if you give me so much money i'm going to be offering so much so many programs and then we invite you know people cultural workers in the field like edwin like patrick um and they spend you know three four days with us and what we call a panel and how the panel works is that you know there's a group of like 10 people museum workers or cultural organizations workers we go over the uh, grants that were written and we hear them tell us, you know, what they like and what they don't like about those grants. We ask them to um, grade them from one to 10. And then we, they, we, grab the, um, we grab all the grades, you know, from all the panelists. We assign, you know, a point to each grant. And then based on the amount of money that we have and based on the, you know, the grading, um, we have a sort of an algorithm that distributes the money um, proportionally. Um, that way, so we make sure that, you know, it's not about who I like, you know, consciously or unconsciously. It's about, you know, the merits of the work that these organizations have been doing and the merits of their grant. And they're being judged by their peers, right? By people that do similar work. What are some of the bureaucratic challenges that you come across well, while running your department? how much time we have um because we want to be very careful with the um, funds you know there are taxpayers funds we don't want to misuse your money we want to be equitable and inclusive sometimes the processes are super long and super bureaucratic right um having come from a museum i work in organizations big and small but the last one, it was um, 16 of us. So, you know, we needed to make a decision. We all get into a room, which is um, look at the problem, look at the different solutions, make a decision and make it happen, right? Government is huge. 
there's a lot of processes to make sure that you know there's no misuse of funds and there's no misuse of you know behavior. We are not misbehaving, right? Um, Think that you know because I'm the commissioner of culture and I have so much power, I could, if I wanted, I could use that power for my own benefit, right? So there's a lot of um, rules and behaviors, and there's a lot of processes that you have to have in place to make sure that um, it's not perceived that I'm acting and you know, conflicting the interests of the city. That makes things go super slow. If there's something I'm learning now, it's just to be patient, right? And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, if we were, were to give a $5,000 grant to an organization, that small amount of money, that's easy. Uh, there's a process, but it's easy. Any grants that we give above $100,000, not only do we make that decision process with the peer of panels to make sure that you know the decision is democratic, but then it has to go to other agencies in the city to make sure that these organizations are um, financially stable, to make sure that these organizations have not misused money in the past. You know, there's a lot of check-ins and balance across you know, the process to make sure that you know, the money that you gave us and the trust that you gave us to um, provide these services, um, it's, it's used um, in the right way. Um, so my question is, do you think that you have met your projected goals when it comes to helping the communities that you oversee? Um, yes and no. Uh, and I promise to answer it really quickly. Um, it's been only, everything's so slow and it's been only four months that I can only do so much. But the, there are two big um, successful stories. One is despite, you know, the economic crisis that we're experiencing and the city's experiencing, um, the budget for arts and culture was cut only 10%, which is nothing compared to other areas in the city. So, and that was, you know, a, a couple of months of us fighting, um, not fighting, but trying to make a case why it was important to fund organizations. And the second one is that being able to convince the mayor that museums uh, needed to reopen. Um, when the decision was made that museums couldn't reopen after phase four, and museums were compared with a mall and indoor dining. And it sort of broke my heart <laughs> to see that we were in that category and just, you know, being able to present enough information to the mayor to see how different museums are from those two other categories and have the mayor say, yes, you're right. You know, we're gonna do this. It was great. So now you all have to light the candles and make sure that the governor allow us to um, open uh, museums very soon. <laughs>